good afternoon to you guys so today we are going to have a discussion about uh, t tests and nmrs and i really appreciate uh, the participation of all of you for this online class um, one is i think our the classroom was not uh, very good at uh, having our uh, there's an issue with the projector so the classroom had some issues and I think uh, as a result of that, uh, I couldn't uh, deliver some of the content very well in the past uh, couple of times. And also, uh, since our class is relatively big in size, uh, sometimes it could be very difficult to get stuff done. So I uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about uh, today's session that being able to do it online so that uh, we can get uh, some of the content delivered uh, appropriately. So now, uh, in the last uh, couple of times, we discussed about how uh, the quantitative research can be utilized to understand differences of groups. In your first semester, our focus was on understanding associations. However, now associations can mostly be studied through correlations and uh, what do you call the chi-square and all of that. But here, there are multiple tests and we are going to see which particular test can be utilized based on the nature of data that we have. Now, today I will be specifically focusing on t-tests and ANOVAS. Now, there are three different types of t-tests, but I will be focusing mainly on two of the t-tests. And there are uh, different types of ANOVAS as well. And then I'll be focusing on two types of ANOVAS as well. So today, the objective is to understand what the t-test is, uh, where exactly we need to apply the t-test and what are the assumptions we need to meet and also what are the other prerequisites that we require okay now always remember the t-tests and ANOVAs are all required to test cause and effect now you need to have a independent variable for this and you need to have a dependent variable for this and you need to have two groups the two groups come from your independent variable. Now, for example, here I have given some examples as well. Let's get, uh, uh, for example, we are going to do a study where you are going to measure uh, achievement in a classroom based on uh, the instructor. So some people might have one instructor and the others have another instructor. And then we are going to see whether the type of instructor has something to do with student performance. Now, in a situation like that, the type of instructor is the independent variable. Student performance is going to be the dependent variable. So in a situation like this, we can use a t-test to evaluate whether this difference is statistically significant. Now, one could ask why exactly we need to do these tests when I can descriptively observe the differences. If I have two classrooms, if I want to check whether their performance have differences, I can pretty much get their averages. If one class has average of 80 and the other has 70, it is very clear one class has performed better than the others. But if we have an independent variable, like for example, the instructor, what we are claiming is, okay, look, there is a difference, but we tell, the difference has occurred because of the instructor. So the type of instructor has something to do with this performance. Now we need to check whether this difference based on the type of instructor has occurred by chance or has it occurred really because of the instructors. That is exactly what we'll be testing with these statistical tests. We are going to see if there is a difference, whether that difference has come purely by chance or whether it has appeared systematically because of something we have done. Now, the resulting output will tell us that. And depending on how you are going to do it, you have a variety of tests to choose from. Now, let's first start with t-tests. Now, t-tests have three different uh, tests. The first one is the single sample t-test. And then you have one called independent samples t-test. And then there's another one called paired sample t-test. Uh, paired sample t-test, some people call it uh, the dependent t-test. Some people call it repeated measures t-test. So any of those is fine. Let's first start with the single sample t-test. 
let's say you are a school teacher and you have a class now you are a class in your class you teach let's say science and let's say you are science students in this semester has scored on an average 92 however the general average for science is 75 now we need to know whether our 92 is statistically significant in terms of the difference from that 75 or whatever the you know previous score the generally the school used to have in that particular grade for that particular classroom so here we don't have two groups here you have just one group the average of this one group is compared with the already established score that is exactly why i said if you are a science teacher if you want to uh, compare your class achievement or class average with that existing score then that is a place where you can do a single samples t-test now in most of the situations what happens is we usually don't do single sample t-tests so as a result i am going to limit our discussion on single sample t-tests and i'm going to focus mostly on this independent sample t-test and paired sample t-test or the repeated measures t-test so independent samples now this particular phrase is very important independent samples means you have two different samples or two different groups for example it could be men and women it could be the type of instructor so this instructor students that instructor students so if you are in one of the groups you should not appear in the other group that's why we call it a independent sample it's independent so you need to have minimum of two groups actually you need not minimum you need only two groups for this you have two groups to test the differences of two groups you can go ahead with the independent samples t-tests so for example it could be between a treatment group and a control group let's say you have a bunch of patients who have toothache i actually have toothache today that's why i'm taking that example let's say you are a dentist you have 20 patients today all of them have toothache now you have some painkillers with you so you have two types of painkillers one is a conventional painkiller the other one is a very advanced new technology you know painkiller now you need to give these painkillers to 10 people one painkiller you give it to the first 10 the new painkiller you give it to the other 10 now you have two groups now here the first thing you have to ask is what is my independent variable my independent variable is the type of painkiller type of painkiller right because i have two painkillers and i'm going to give it to people so my independent variable is type of painkiller and i should be able to randomly assign people into a specific painkiller maybe since you are the dentist you can maybe flip a coin and decide which person is going to get which painkiller you are going to randomly do it because without random assignment this is not going to be effective now you have your independent variable now we are going to see the time on an average these people are going to come and tell that they no longer feel the pain in their tooth so the lesser average time will tell the power of the drug so if this new drug is actually good the time it takes for the person to come and say look my pain is gone should be lesser compared to the conventional drug now let's say on an average people who have got the conventional drug took one hour to tell that their pain has gone away and let's say the the newer drug on an average people have taken 42 minutes to come and tell okay look pain is gone now from 42 to 60 minutes there's a noticeable difference there's a difference of 18 minutes now we need to check whether this 18 minutes is by chance or because of the actual drug for that since you have two groups under the same independent variable we are going to do an independent samples t-test an independent sample t-test will always have one independent variable you can't have more than one independent variable for a t-test always one independent variable and one dependent variable so 
within that independent variable, you can have only two groups and we do this to compare the averages. You get what I'm saying? So you can descriptively compare averages, but after that we do this to see whether this difference is statistically significant. Now, that is the independent sample t-test. Now, I have given an example here as well. So, let's say this, uh, we have two groups here, group A and group B. Group A has 30 participants and group B has 30 participants. I am going to have my group A as the treatment group. Treatment group means the group that always receives whatever the thing that we need to test. The control group is the group that is not going to receive anything, okay? Because sometimes we need to have a better method of comparing. What if we don't have the treatment? How are they going to react, okay? So that is something as well. Now, here's what is going to happen. You have the two groups, the treatment group and the control group, and then, we are going to see what exactly is happening to their averages. Now, if you notice here, the control group has an average of 65. And then the treatment group has an average of 75. Now, there's a clear difference. If you just descriptively observe this, there's a very clear difference of 10 points. Now, even if the difference is very limit, uh, minimal, let's say the difference is three points, four points, depending on the size of your sample, it could still be significant, okay? So here we have just a small difference. And if you use uh, independent samples t-test, you can confirm whether this uh, difference is statistically significant or not. Now, in, in this kind of situations, independent samples t-tests are... Uh, actually very useful. Now, very similar to independent samples t-test, you also have another one that is repeated measures t-test or dependent t-test. In dependent t-test, what happens is you have the same group, but you measure them twice, like a pre-test and a post-test. Let's say you are the dentist. <clears throat> you are going to measure uh, the severity of a toothache for a group of 20 patients. Let's say you have a severity measuring scale where it can measure the severity from zero to 10 or let's say zero to 100. Now, depending on what we are doing now here, let's say the severity was 65, all the 20 on an average before the administration of the drug. And after the administration, the severity has come down to let's say 28. Now, 100 would mean higher severity of pain, zero would mean lesser severity of pain. Now you have the same group, but for the same group, you are going to you know test them twice. For example, before the administration of the drug, we call it a pre-test, and then after the administration of a drug, that's the post-test. So if my individuals, now here we have 30 individuals, if the score of severity has come down in our post-test, it is very clear that our drug is going to be effective. But I need to do this t-test to confirm that the difference that I have observed is actually statistically significant. Now, this is exactly what happens in a t-test. If it is independent, you will be comparing two groups. If it is repeated measures, you will be comparing the same group twice. Now, there are a few things that you have to consider to improve the quality of uh, research like this. One, you have to closely monitor extraneous variables. Extraneous variables are any variable that will impact your study. For example, if you are a dentist and you are going to measure the severity of pain in your individuals, even though you have the capacity to measure pain of individuals, there could be individuals who have been exposed to toothaches for a long period of time. Because of that, although they experience toothache, they have a higher chance of coping it. So they might report the severity. Uh, let's say if the severity is actually 65, the person might note it down as 55. 
not because you know they have less severity it's because it is because they have more uh, capacity to cope up with the pain why because they have been exposed to it for a longer period of time in any experimental research that you do a person's previous experiences is going to have a effect a negative impact actually so that is the extraneous variable a person's previous experience is extraneous variable very similar to that there could be other extraneous variables as well so when you design a study you have to think of these extraneous variables as well you have to think of the statistical test that you are going to use and you have to think about the overall design as well what are the variables that could impact my study how am i going to take care of this so you have to think of all of that as well and you need to also think about your hypothesis how am i going to develop my hypothesis because our hypothesis should reflect the test that we'll be running as well and the overall nature of our study as well now here i have given a sample title if you notice it says investigating effects of teaching style on student performance i am going to do a study to see whether student performance can be improved by adopting a different teaching style so now to do a t test i need to have two groups so teaching style is my independent variable for this independent variable i need to have two groups so i am going to have one treatment group one control group my treatment group will receive this new teaching style and the control group will have the classes as usual and then we are going to check student performance after some weeks by conducting an exam now for this we have to come up with a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis so our null hypothesis will tell teaching style has no statistically significant effect on student performance and our alternative one will say teaching style has a statistically significant effect on student performance now please take note here in your previous lessons in the last semester when we did correlations we always used the word there's a correlation there's a association and all of that that is because we actually ran correlations to check associations here we don't check associations we are not interested in finding correlations here we are interested in finding cause and effect so therefore instead of doing or using words like correlation and co uh, the associations here we are using words like effect and then you can say impact influence for example teaching style has a statistically significant impact on student performance that is also all right teaching style has a statistically significant uh, influence on student performance one could even say teaching style causes uh, changes in student performance so the word causes can be used if you do a proper experiment so the experiment has to be designed now if you notice this this is designing an experiment is a bit of a process we start with the idea of the study then you have to design what kind of groups you are going to have what are my independent variables what is my dependent variable and then you have to see whether a t test would actually fit if you have two groups you can definitely run a t test okay so do you guys have any questions from this particular slide the one that we have just told no sir awesome now this is the basic impression of a t test now if you do a t test manually this is the equation for a t test and i have included i think uh, towards the end of this module we'll discuss how to run a t test manually as well because understand the concepts would be very useful we don't need to do it manually we have the software to run it but it would be better if we have some understanding now usually the t tests are pretty robust for little little violations however we had to make sure that we have a decent sample size there are different mechanisms to get an idea about the minimum sample size required we will discuss how to get a minimal sample size calculation later but for now let's say 
anything above 30 is generally okay. But if you have a very low sample size, sometimes your study is actually good, but due to the low sample size, the differences that you want to see is not properly reflected. And if you remember, last week we also discussed about uh, what you call outliers and all of that. So if you have a very small sample size and if there are individuals with extreme scores, those extreme scores would also have an impact on the overall study. So that is going to be another problem as well. Now, we discussed about the independent samples t-test. Now, if you think about the same, you know, instructing style and student performance, you can do it using a dependent t-test as well. For example, let's say uh, you want to test teaching style and student performance, but you don't have so much of students. You have just, you know, uh, let's say one group of students, and then you want to see whether your new teaching style is going to work. So what you are going to do is now you have been teaching your students all this time using your previous teaching method. So you are going to measure their student performance right now. That's the pretest, okay? And then after that, you can actually do your new teaching style for a few weeks and measure student performance again. Now you have a pretest and a post test to go ahead and do a dependence t test. If you have two groups, to measure the difference of two groups, you can do the independent t test. But if you don't have a big sample, you need to measure the same group before and after. For that, you can do a dependent t test. Uh, let's talk about another example. Let's say you work in a, a hotel where there is a bar. And inside the bar, uh, people can consume alcohol. And your bar has given a chance for people to smoke as well. Now, some people uh, get very irritated when other people smoke because it has uh, a very you know, bad smell coming out as well. Now, this could seriously disrupt the satisfaction of people. Now, you are the manager of this bar and you need to check whether people will be actually satisfied if this smoking thing is actually stopped inside the bar. So... As of now, the ban is not being imposed. So what you do is you measure the satisfaction of your attendees today. And hypothetically, let's think a couple of weeks later, the same people are going to come to your bar. And on that particular occasion, after the ban, you are going to again test the same people for their satisfaction. Now, if the satisfaction has risen, from the previous instance to this instance, then yes, the smoking ban has actually an effect in terms of boosting the satisfaction of people. So since this is the same group of people that you are measuring before and after, to check that difference for its statistical significance, you can use a dependent t-test. So it's a matter of us visualizing whether we have two groups or whether we have the same group measured twice before and after. So in that kind of situations, we can actually use t-tests. Now, we'll go through one more example here. Here I have some statistical output as well. Now, this is an example for a dependent t-test. Now, let's read this. It says here, uh, Jason is an experimental social psychologist. He wanted to know whether violence in television could have a significant effect on empathy. So to study this, he recruited 30 students and recorded their empathy scores before and after a movie. Empathy was measured using a newly devised scale. The maximum achievable in this scale is 10 and the minimum is 1. Now, if you get a study like this, the first thing that we need to do is we need to check what the independent variable is and what the dependent variable is. Now, looking at this, if you read this uh, description, it says the psychologist wanted to know violence in television and its effect on empathy. So here, the independent variable is violence and the dependent variable is empathy. 
So the first thing that we need to do is we have to come up with the hypothesis. Now, this is our hypothesis. I have just given the alternative hypothesis. Here it says television violence has a statistically significant positive effect on empathy. We think television violence could have an effect on empathy. So now, this is the dependent T test. So the person has measured these 30 students before the violent movie and after the violent movie. Now, these are the results. Before the movie, the mean score for empathy was 7.33. This is descriptive statistics, okay? And here it says we have 30 people. And then after the movie, if you notice, this mean has come down from 7.33 to 3.47. Now, this is the difference that we are talking about. Now, there's a very clear notice, there's a clear noticeable difference here between the means of the before and after. Now, if you run a t-test in SPSS, the t-test output would look something like this. This is the t-test output. Now, there's something that you need to note here. Now, here it says before the movie and after the movie, there is a mean difference of 3.867 points from 7.33 to uh, 3.47. There is a bit of a difference. So, they have given this mean difference between the two groups. And if you take note here, this is what we call the T value. If you run a T test manually, it will generate a T value. This T value will help us to decide whether our study is significant or not using another points table for probabilities. That is if we do it manually. But if you do it with the software, if you see the mean here, the only thing that you have to check again is this last column right here, significance. This significance, SIG, will tell you whether your study is statistically significant or not. Now, statistical significance come only if the p-value, this is the p-value, okay, this SIG significance, that's the same thing as p-value. This p-value or the significance value has to be less than 0 0.05. Now, if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, what it says is this mean difference between the before watching the violence movie and after watching the violence movies statistically significant and if that's the case i am going to accept my alternative hypothesis which says violent tv shows have a statistically significant effect on empathy or if not television violence has a statistically significant causative effect on empathy so both of these hypotheses are correct these are just uh, two different ways of writing the same thing i'm going to just get this here as well okay like this this is the same hypothesis just two different ways of writing. So here, based on the significance value, I can go ahead and accept my alternative hypothesis. By any chance, if the significance value is more than 0 0.05, for example, 0 0.23, 0 0.56 or something like that, in that case, our difference, although we can see it, it is not statistically significant. In that case, we have to go ahead and accept our null hypothesis, which says that there is no statistical significance. So the p-value, usually it is 0.05%. It comes from a confidence interval of 95%. So we are generally sure that uh, if our, uh, what do you call this, difference is not occurring by chance, then the chances of this being erroneous has to be less than 0.05% or 5% or which uh, or uh, 0. You know, 0 0.05. So that is something, you know, that uh, we had to keep in our minds when we do this. So that's why we keep a 95% uh, confidence interval. So whatever the error that we are going to see, it has to be less than 5%. So 0 0.05, the probability now here, it says 0 0.000. So probably after many zeros, there would be some other number as well. So what it means is 
this is not by chance this difference is actually occurring because of the movie and uh, even if this is going to be wrong the chances of this being wrong is extremely minimal like maybe once in once in a thousand or something like that so we don't have to worry too much about that why because the study is statistically significant now this is a dependent t test if you do the same thing for a uh, independent samples t test it's going to be the same as well and we'll do a small exercise today to understand that as well now this is the result now this is just raw output of spss now in research methods when you do something like this you can't just put tables like this first you have to format the tables you know how to format now apa tables and after that this is how you would report your data now this is dr jason's study results when you report the t test this is the format that you have to follow you have to give the t value and then within brackets we have to give the degrees of freedom degrees of freedom is available here just before the significance this is degrees of freedom and after that you have to give a equal mark and then you give the t value separate by a comma and then you give the p value so it should look something like this t29 equals 6.948 6.948 has come from here see 6.948 and uh, the p value is 000, zero, zero. You can like uh, write it like this. If not, you can write it like this as well to show significance. Both of these methods are okay. Now, if you think what this is, this is actually this D equals 1.9. That is Cohen's D. I have given a hyperlink here as well in the presentation. Cohen's D is a way of finding the effect size. We'll discuss this in depth later. But what happens is, essentially speaking, there could be differences between groups, but we need to know how big this difference is, which is something that we can do by effect size calculation. One thing you have to understand is when you have a small sample size, we need to have a noticeable difference. However, if you have a larger group of people, even the simplest difference could be statistically significant. Let's say uh, we have 100 people divided into two groups, 50-50 for academic achievement. The difference is three points. So probably the test is going to say it is not significant. But now I have an, in another study, 100,000 people divided into 50,000 and 50,000 with on an average difference of three points. Now, since I have a larger sample size, probably that three point difference is going to be very significant because it's a noticeable significance uh, difference for a larger group of people. Now, larger sample sizes are generally capable of getting you statistical significance. So some researchers know this. So what they do is they tend to get extremely large samples for their studies. Now, getting a bigger sample size will not guarantee that your ideas are actually accurate. Your study will say it is statistically significant, which is exactly why we go ahead and run uh, and test for effect size as well and effect size will tell whether our studies are actually significant or not your study is already significant but we need to know how significant it is which is by Cohen's D and there are many other mechanisms for that as well usually the the values will tell how far away these means are from one another so 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, those kind of values indicate that there's a noticeable effect in uh, the, the two groups or a noticeable effect of, you know, the independent variable to the dependent variable. Now, 1.9 is a pretty large effect size. And when you write it, this is how you would write now, if you write to a research report, in your results section, you first do descriptives and then you test for assumptions and then you would give you a t-test output. And if you give the t-test output, first you have to give these t-tables 
and then you have to narrate your findings so when you narrate this is how you would narrate for example the group of students showed a significant difference in their empathy after viewing the movie and then you have to give what you observed see like this t29 equals 6.948 that's the t value and then the p value and the effect size the scores obtained for empathy before the movie is this is higher than the empathy scores generated after the movie like this thus hypothesis one is approved so if you notice here in this description we have given all the relevant information we have said the study is significant and we have given the mean values as well we have given standard deviation values and then we have said our hypothesis is accepted it is very important that you tell that your hypothesis is accepted now here i have given some other effect size calculations you remember coefficient of determination r squared you can actually calculate r squared for the t test as well and instead of cohen's d you can actually include r squared and then there's another one called eta squared we'll learn that later you can include eta squared instead of cohen's d as well now this is just to show the, the difference between a pre and a post session now the same strategy can be applied to numerous other instances as well for example if you think about uh, uh, the example that i gave earlier before and after a smoke band so the satisfaction before and after can be tested in a very similar manner using a dependent t test now here's what we are going to do i am going to give you a sample set of data and then let's enter it to SPSS and see whether we could actually run this test. Now I'm going to open up a new slide and I'm going to just name, uh, name it uh, data set for class activity. So I'm going to just, you know, cook up a study, you know, out of thin air here. Let's uh, come up with a small study. So I'm going to put a table here. Yeah, let's insert the table how many columns do we need we need two columns and then let's say we need uh, 21 rows okay that table is slightly bigger let's go for a small sample okay, i need two columns and let's say okay so this is going to be a very small study now here i have my first variable that is groups and here I have my, uh, let's say, uh, scores. Now, first, here's what we need to do. We need to first identify what our groups are going to be. Now, here, I am going to have uh, six participants as uh, group one. Okay, and then next six as group two. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. Now these are my two groups. Now, when you enter data to SPSS for a T test, you need to create two variables. One would be the grouping variable, the other would be the scores variable. Now, just to make this study realistic, I am going to make sure that this study is going to be about the effectiveness of the drug to check fever. Okay, I'm going to make this my study title, drug type, okay, sorry, drug and fever. So fever can be measured with temperature, right? So I'm going to just keep it like that. Now, okay, let me color this a bit. This is my study, drug and fever. So group one is my treatment group. So they are going to get a particular drug. Let's say I'm going to give... Uh, Tell me a good painkiller. Okay, I'm going to give them a Panadol. Not a good painkiller, but okay, that's okay. Panadol is effective. So I'm going to just give Panadol for everyone. So these are, this uh, group is my Panadol group. Okay, everyone who is identified as one in this data set receives Panadol. Now, I need to have a control group. Usually in a study like this, you can't compare just two drugs. 
why when you compare two drugs, what happens is we don't know how the person would perform when there is no drug involved. So I need to know whether Panadol is effective or not by giving Panadol to some people and by not giving anything for the other group so that I can compare and understand whether Panadol is effective or not. Now, uh, this is my control, so I'm going to just say control. So control guys don't receive anything. Or oh, if not, you can give them some like a sugar pill or something so that uh, they would have no idea whether uh, they were given like a proper drug or not. Now, the next thing is now you had to record their scores. So here, the scores would be the temperatures. Okay, now, uh, okay, without temperature, let's get something else. Uh, the fatigue. I don't know the temperatures of human body, so I'm going to go with something like fatigue. So let's say those who are taking Panadol would have less fatigue compared to those who don't receive anything. So fatigue can be rated from, let's say, 1 to 10. 1 means no fatigue. And 10 means fatigue. A lot, okay? Now... People who receive Panadol, these are their scores. 2, 3, 1, 4, 5, and 1. And here's my control group zero you know, scores. Okay. Now, this is the sample data set. See, now we have a very small study and we need the sample. And here's six, uh, sample set of data. And here's exactly how it would look like. Now, I want you to actually transfer this data to SPSS. Now, when you transfer this, first you need to go to your variable view, okay? Go to your variable view. And once you are in your variable view, you have to create two variables. Create two variables. The first one that you create should be type of drug. Now, here, Instead of adding one Panadol, one Panadol and all of that, only add one and two. For example, if you add one, that would mean, you know, that's the Panadol group. If you add two, that would be, you know, the control group. So when you create your variable, you will notice in the variable view, there is a place for you to define your variable. You have to click on that. Let me show it to you here. You have to click on that. Give me a second. I'm going to just open up another presentation. Okay, here. Uh, like this. Now, this is a variable view, right? Now, in this variable view, let's say you are going to create a variable like type of drug. It will first ask whether it is numeric or string. It has to be numeric. Width and decimals, you can keep it like that. For the label, you can write maybe type of drug. And then here, it will ask for values. Now here in this example, it says none, but in your case, type of drug, you have to give values. So you click on this. In this none, you would see there's a small other little thing, you know, appearing to the corner of this tab. You click on that, and then it will ask you to define your values. Then you enter one and tell one is Panadol and then you add it and then you put two and they say it's a control one and then you add it and then uh, it's uh, the measure is going to be nominal and then that's it. So that is one variable that you are going to create and then you are going to create another variable for fatigue. That variable you don't have values why it is a continuous variable because we are going to measure they are level of fatigue from 0 to 10. It's a continuous variable. And here, the measure for that variable, you are going to select as scale. Why? Because it's a continuous one. And once you do that, we can go ahead and run our study. Now, I think if anyone of you need, you can share the screen, OK? Uh, who is ready to share their screen and then I can guide you as well so that others can see as well. Who would want to share? 
maybe you can take a screenshot of this data set and then you know quickly enter and uh, if anyone of you would want to share that would be better as well <coughs> so please add this data okay create the two variables first one the group and the second one would be the scores Swipe across. And then this one is static. And once you enter the data, go to analyze. Then next step is compare means. And then you select independent samples t test. Like this, this is the steps. Okay. So if you run this correctly, you should be getting an output uh, like the one that we, you know, discussed earlier where you can observe whether these means are significant or not. Now, this is a very simple study and we have a smaller sample, but in the instance where you have a larger sample, then it would pretty much look like this, but then you have a bigger sample, okay? So take about 10 minutes and then uh, keep on adding this data and then you run the test, I'll be here. If you have any questions, just ask me, okay? Okay, so how many of you were able to create the two variables? Yeah, so uh, grouping variable is always the independent variable and the dependent variable is fatigued. Yeah, it should look like this. So when you add uh, your test variables, fatigue should be here on the top. And then when you want to run the independent T test, take the drug variable and include it under the grouping variable. So now you have two variables. One is a scale, that's the dependent variable that comes under the test variable. And then uh, the drug variable, you put it to the grouping variable. Now, then it will ask you to define the group. So if you have added one and two, like the one that I have given in the data set, then you have to define the groups as one and two here. And then you can hit OK, and then the analysis will run. So uh, once one of you actually run the analysis, uh, you can share it with the entire class uh, in the group chat so that all of us can see uh, what exactly the results are. And then we can also go ahead and report our results as well. So here I have given a hypothesis as well. Now, whenever you get a study like this, it would be better if you can come up with the hypothesis. Now, here I have given the hypothesis type of drug has a statistically significant effect on fatigue. This is exactly my alternative hypothesis. So my, uh, what do you call, uh, the null hypothesis would say that uh, the type of drug has no statistically significant effect on fatigue. Now, Let's say you have run your analysis. If you run your analysis, this is how you should report. So I have given here as per the results obtained in the study, Panadol has a statistically significant effect in reducing fatigue. And then you have to give the T degrees of freedom, the T value, the P value. And then I have also given on an average, individuals who took Panadol reported lesser fatigue compared to the control group, okay? So this would be how you would be reporting your results, okay? Okay, so let's actually, you know, uh, discuss our results a little bit here. So while uh, I, I just, you know, quickly added the data to Jamo here, I don't have SPSS, but you know, uh, if you use SPSS, you had to go to analyze, then uh, compare means and independent samples T-test, 
Now, I use Jamovi. So in Jamovi, it would look like this. So this is my two variables. I have added my grouping variable as a series of ones here, the first six. First individual, you know, Panadol, this is the fatigue score. Second one, Panadol, this is the fatigue score. And these are our control individuals. And these are their scores. Now, I ran a t-test. Now, if you use SPSS, you have to go to analyze, compare means, and then go to independent samples t-test. In Jamovi, you can uh, go to t-test and select independent sample t-test. So fatigue, I'm going to put as the dependent variable and grouping, I'm going to put as the grouping variable. So in SPSS, once again, the grouping variable should come to the grouping variable. But in SPSS, you need to define your groups as one and two, because when you add the data, you have to identify which one is which, okay, in the values. And after that, this is my initial independent sample status output I got from Jamovi. And uh, let's get more data here. I'm going to get the mean differences. Now, fatigue scores. And then I'm going to get uh, some more descriptives here. These are my descriptives. I have two groups. The first one has six. The second one has six. My Panadol group has a mean score of 2.67. If you run this on SPSS, you should be getting the same value. And our second group has received a mean of 5.67. Now, as you notice here, there's a noticeable difference. It's a very clear uh, difference. And this is our hypothesis. Hypothesis is given here as well. It says uh, mu one is not equal to mu two, which means mean of the first group is not equal to the mean of the second group. Uh, you can actually write the hypothesis in this manner as well. One method of writing the hypothesis is to write by words saying uh, the type of drug has a statistically significant effect on fatigue. If not, you can simply say the two groups are different. Because we are going to check anyways the difference. No, you can uh, uh, write it like this. That is also perfectly all right. And this is our t test output. There's a, This is our p-value. There's a mean difference of uh, three points. It's given here. And if you look here, this is our p-value. P-value is 0 .04, 0 0.04 is less than 0 0.05. What it means is the drug that we have administered has a statistically significant effect in eliminating fatigue. Now, what's the drug we have used? We have used Panadol with a control group. So we know compared to the people who are not given medication, people who have got Panadol have reported lesser fatigue and that difference in fatigue is statistically significant. Why? Because the p-value is 0 0.04. Now, uh, you can also go ahead and check for normality here. Now, in SPSS, normality can't be checked like this. In normal, uh, to, For you to check normality, you have to go ahead and run descriptive analysis. Now, in the class next week, when we physically meet, I'll get you guys to run these tests on SPSS as well. But today I'm going to just show it to you through Jamovi. And if anyone of you would want to switch from SPSS to Jamovi, that is perfectly all right as well. I personally think Jamovi is quite easier to use because you don't have to work too much to run analysis. It's just that in SPSS, it always takes you to have a few more steps. The reason why we use SPSS is because most of the degree programs require students to use SPSS. And I will get a confirmation from the department whether we need to stick to SPSS or whether we are okay to go ahead with Jamo because I think if we can make that switch, it would make life easier for all of us. Now, no melting. See the no melting here? Fatigue. Uh, it's uh, 0 0.442. So the... Uh, no melty actually has no issues here. But the only thing that we don't know here is whether uh, this no melty is actually being calculated based on the group because ideally the no melty has to be checked for each of the groups. Uh, that is something that we can do on SPSS. Here somehow it is not given. 
but the overall p values that are given for the normality test is not significant so that is all right and then you can do a homogeneity test as well last week we discussed about homogeneity test that we can do using the levine's test and that is also not significant it is 0 0.07 so what it means is the homogeneity is not violated. It is very close to getting violated, but it is not violated. So uh, technically we are uh, okay. But if it has gone uh, below that value, see it says here a low P value suggests a violation of the assumption of equal variances. Now we are very closer to violation uh, violating it, but we haven't violated it. So. I think if we increase the sample size, uh, it is not going to be a problem. This is just a very simple, uh, a very small sample size. What you can do is for the same data, if you add a few more uh, participants, like maybe add three individuals to group one and three individuals to group uh, two, probably you will notice that these values would drastically change. If you want, you can do a QQ plot as well. You can do a effect size calculation. Let's uh, get that effect size as well. See, uh, we have Cohen's D, negative 1.33. Uh, so that's a larger effect size. So usually you can take a, a effect size calculation as well, and then you can go ahead and report that too. Now, this is exactly a basic impression of an independent samples t-test. Now, based on this, we can actually add our data let me quickly add this data to our uh, results. Our T value is 2 point, negative 2.31. That is our T statistic. For deg uh, degrees of freedom is 10. And our T value is negative 2.31. And our P value is 0. Point, 0. Point, 044 and uh, people who have obtained Panadol have received a mean of 2.67 2.67 with a standard deviation of 1.63 okay now let me share my screen back to our presentation Now, based on what we did, it should look like this. As per the results obtained in this study, Panadol has a statistically significant effect in reducing fatigue. T, 10, 10 is the degrees of freedom. And then this is the T value. And then uh, we have... Uh, that's the T value. And then we have P value, that is 0 0.044. And then I have said on an average, individuals who took Panadol reported lesser fatigue. This is the mean of uh, the Panadol group 2.67 with a standard deviation of 1.63 compared to the control group. So if you want, you can actually add the mean and standard deviation of the control group as well. And then towards the end, you could say thus, hypothesis one is accepted. Like this, you can say uh, thus H1. Thus, H1 is accepted. So this is how we actually go ahead and test the differences in two groups. Now, what you need to understand is how to apply this in different, different situations. So now what we have done is just a simple drug comparison for a simple group. Now you have to imagine how to do this in other situations as well. It could be about uh, comparing performance of two classes. It could be about comparing the performance of something that we have done before and after. So likewise, you can run multiple tests. And based on this, we can see how exactly the differences are being recognized. Are these differences statistically significant or not? So this is the basic impression of that. So I would encourage all of you to spend some time uh, going through our you know, lesson content, 
and also taking the time to actually run some of these tests to understand how exactly we could take the maximum benefit out of the softwares that we use. And once you run it uh, a few times and once you run a few analysis, it will become very clear to you how to go ahead and test the differences of two groups. Now, uh, do you have any questions, like any areas that you are not really clear here about uh, the t-test or the results that you have obtained or running the analysis? Any specific problems that you may have here? Now, the effect size usually says if you get now, if you get two groups, each group has a mean, right? So if you put it in a bell curve, each group would have a mean, but what we are going to see is how far away the mean of one group is to another. And the effect sizes will give us a particular indication as to how big this difference is. Now, uh, usually values closer to zero would indicate the effect size is minimal. And larger values, 0 0.5 and above, would indicate there's a larger effect size. Now, if you, for example, if you, for example, if you get R squared, R squared says the, the percentage of influence one has on the other. Very similar to that here also. If we have a larger Cohen's D, what it means is that there's a bigger effect size. There is no cutoff point per se, but generally speaking, 0 0.5 and above, that's a larger effect size. So if we usually go for a larger effect, if we usually see something more than that, what it means is our study is significant. At the same time, our study has a bigger effect size as well. So then uh, the hypothesis is really strong. But sometimes what happens is there are some people who report only the statistical significance with the p-value. But when you actually do a calculation on uh, the Cohen's D or R squared for that matter, that effect size is negligible. So that kind of thing should say uh, the significance probably must have come because of the sample size and not because, you know, there's a bigger effect. Now, uh, when we do our lesson on how to manually calculate a t-test, we can also see how the effect size also can be manually calculated. But if you use the software, it uh, sort of comes, uh, you know, uh, with the default output that we'll be getting. Now, that is how usually we find effect size. So any other questions on the same? Okay, so here's what we are going to do. If you don't have any questions, we are going to go for a small break. And then once we come back from the break, we are going to see what to do if we have more than two groups. Now, we have already been discussing the instances where we could have only two groups, but what if we have more than two groups? Now, that's a different scenario. And we are going to discuss that scenario once we come back from the break. Okay, so right now it's uh, 2.50. So let's go for a break uh, about 15 minutes. And uh, once we uh, start the class at around 3.05, uh, we can go ahead with the rest. Okay, so we'll go for a small break and come. Okay, so uh, we were earlier discussing about t-tests. And now we have run a simple exercise to understand how a t-test work as well. Now from there, let's discuss instances where we would have more than two groups. Now, if you have more than two groups, you would have to use something called a one-way analysis of variance. Uh, in short, we actually call it an ANOVA. ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. So one way means it has only one independent variable. If you have one independent variable in a t-test, you have one independent variable, but it has only two groups, which means the independent variable is your grouping variable. And that grouping variable has only two groups. Now we are talking about the instance where the same independent variable, it has more than two groups. If it has more than two groups, a t-test cannot be performed. In such an instance, you might have to go ahead and uh, do a one-way ANOVA. Now, ANOVAs also have the same set of assumptions. You have to test for normality. You have to test for uh, homogeneity of variances. 
and all of that as well. But however, the thing about running an ANOVA is ANOVA will tell now in a t-test you can directly see the two groups are different but in ANOVA what happens is if you have let's say four groups three groups or five groups for that matter it will tell the groups are different but it will not tell directly which groups are different from one another in a statistically significant manner so because of that each time you run an ANOVA you would have to also run a post hoc analysis. This post hoc analysis will tell you what groups are significantly different from another. But uh, we'll discuss about post hoc in a little while. But let's try to understand how an ANOVA works a little bit more. Now, these are some of the calculations for ANOVA. Once again, what you have to remember is there's between group ANOVA and then there's repeated measures ANOVA. Just like the t-test, if you compare three independent groups, that is independent, you know, groups ANOVA. Simply put, you know, one way ANOVA if it is one independent variable. But if you measure the same group more than two times, then you would have to do repeated measures ANOVA. I'll give you one example. Let's say you are a therapist therapist in the sense you know like a psychotherapist or a clinical psychologist and you have been uh, conducting a novel approach to psychotherapy let's say a new variant of cbt or something like that now you have a group of people <laughs> who are currently experiencing some symptoms of depression let's say you have 20 people like this presently in your practice and let's assume that you only treat people with depression now in your clinic, first you are going to assess their current level of depression. Let's say out of 20, their current level of depression is 15. So they are not severely depressed, but moderately depressed. Now, you are going to use your new CBT techniques. And you are going to measure the effectiveness of your new CBT techniques in two weeks time. Now, we have a pre-test and now we have a post-test as well. But you know the effectiveness of a therapy like CBT cannot be assessed just by two weeks. You have to apply it for more weeks. So you are going to again measure them after eight weeks as well. So you are measuring them before the treatment. You are measuring them two weeks with the treatment. And then you are measuring them again after eight weeks of treatment as well. Now you are measuring the same group three times. If you measure the same group twice, then you can do repeated measures T-test. But since you measure them three different times, more than two times, because of that, you might have to do repeated measures and more. Now, in a t-test, the alternative hypothesis will tell the two groups are not equal, like this mu1 and mu2 are different. In a ANOVA, the understanding is the three groups will be different from one another. That is exactly what we are going to check here analysis of variance now there are uh, different types of ANOVAs that we can run now here is a basic impression once again now if you have let's say uh, here i have you know given an independent variable or grouping variable that is gender now here i have three levels the first one let's say male Level two would be female and level three would be, you know, those who don't like to identify. Okay. So we have level one, level two and level three. So these are three different groups. Now, if you want to just compare the two groups, let's say men and women, that would be a between group T test. Very easy. Now, just to make this easy, I'm going to include a dependent variable here. as well. Let's say dependent variable is... Uh, uh, quality of life okay quality of life this is your dependent variable so this dependent variable will be the same dependent variable for everyone in this particular study let's say you are going to study gender gender's impact on quality of life gender's impact on quality of life so you have two groups men and women but let's say 
you are a more inclusive kind of a person you have recently gone on a tour to america and on your way back you have come with the realization okay look uh, there could be you know more than two genders so you are going to select men women and also uh, people who do not identify within those you know two groups so what happens is now you have three groups now you are going to check whether gender has an impact on quality of life in which gender actually has not just two groups three groups in that case you would have to run a one way anova so gender you have three groups within that this is your independent group independent variable independent variable has three groups so in that case you might have to run a one way anova to find whether their quality of life scores are going to be significantly different from one another okay now that is exactly how we do it and there are some other types of anovas as well two way anova three way anova but before we go and understand those let's try to understand how the anova actually works now i am going to get the same data set we earlier had this is the same data set that we earlier had and i'm going to you know again paste it here and slightly change this so that we can run the analysis okay now earlier we had only three groups sorry two groups now i'm going to expand this into uh, three groups i'm going to remove some of this data as well and i'm going to move these guys up Okay. okay now here in this data set i have five individuals who are given panadol and then i have five individuals who are given uh, not given anything and i'm going to just add uh, a couple or so more uh, what do you call rows here give me a second i'm going to add another row here okay now i need to check now i know my panadol is effective I know my Panadol is effective against people who don't, who haven't received anything. But now someone comes and tells, hey, you know what? There's a drug that is effective, you know, more effective than a Panadol. Then I ask, what, is, what exactly is that particular drug? And one could say, hey, have you tried ibuprofen? Ibuprofen is even further effective. Or let's say Panadol Actifast. So I'm going to check whether Panadol Actifast is better than uh, normal Panadol. Now, this is my third group. Actifast group. So I have five individuals who have actually obtained Actifast as well. So I'm going to just uh, write it like this Actifast. So this is my Actifast group. Now let's check whether we have five for each one of these. So Panadol, I have only five. Control group, I have one, two, three, four, five. And then I have active fast group one, two, three, four, five as well. Now here I'm going to just add some random values. Now here now I have three groups. Now the three groups can be once again analyzed for its group differences. But this time we are going to do it through a one way ANOVA. So the first thing is similar to the last time you have to create two variables. This time in the type of drug, you go to the variable view. Instead of two values, now you have to identify three values because now you have three groups and your third group is the active fast group. And then you go to the fatigue and then you go to the data view and then you start adding the rest of the data as well. Now, our hypothesis is going to be the same. The type of drug has a statistically significant effect on fatigue. There's going to be no change. So let's take about five minutes and transfer this data to SPSS so that we can see uh, how exactly we are going to run a, uh, what do you call ANOVA. And let me quickly give you the, the process of running ANOVA as well. Uh, ANOVA process SPSS. Uh, you had to go to analyze and then uh, okay, give me a second. I'm going to quickly get it.
under analyze there's uh compare means okay give me a second so okay go to analyze and then compare means in compare means you will find there's one called you know uh one way and over okay these are the steps one way and over okay and uh, using this you can actually run the one way and over so please enter the data and then uh, i'll give you about five to ten minutes so please run the one way and over, and then we'll check your data okay now let's try to understand what exactly you know happens here now here you have three groups and unlike the previous time now each group has only five members which means my sample has become even smaller now uh, if you have added the data let me show you here the added data should look something like this pretty similar to what we have done in the two way and uh, the the t-test here once again i have my first group here the second group here and my third group and i have my data here as well type of drug and fatigue now i'm going to just run a very simple anova here so in jamovi i'm going to select one way anova in uh, uh, SPSS, you can go to analyze, compare means, and one way and over. And now we have to select our variables. So fatigue is my dependent, and drug is my grouping variable. Now, this is my first output of ANOVA. Now, these are the stuff that you have to uh, notice here. Fatigue is my dependent variable. This is the if statistic. In T test, you use a T statistic. Now, when you do these calculations manually, this statistic is used against a probability table to get the p-value to know whether our hypothesis is accepted or not. In the software, we don't actually need it. But just for your information, this is the if-statistic. In ANOVAs, we usually have something called an if-statistic. In a t-test, you have a t-statistic. Now, here we have two degrees of freedom. Now, Uh, the two degrees of freedom actually come from one uh, based on the number of groups, that is DF1, and the DF2 is based on the total number of uh, individuals we have in the study. I'm going to get some descriptives as well. And then, uh, if you notice, uh, these are my three groups. Here we have uh, one, two, three. One is my Panadol group. Panadol group has uh, five participants. And then you can see their mean is three. Now, there's a small difference here compared to the previous t-test because t-test had six individuals. Therefore, our mean was two point something. Now I have five. Based on those five, the mean is three. And the standard deviation value is given here as well. And if you notice here, the second group is the control group. Those guys have a mean of 6. And then our third one is the active ask group. They have a mean of 1.6. And if you notice, the least mean is by the active ask group. So the lower the value, the lesser the fatigue. So if you notice, active ask has a higher chance of bringing down the fatigueness of individuals compared to even the Panadol group. So based on these results, it seems that ActiFast is far better than Panadol. Now, descriptively speaking, you can see, yes, there's a noticeable difference. But I need to know whether these differences are statistically significant or not. So that statistical significance is actually given here. If you notice, here we have the p-value. It says 0 0.038. So if you add this data on SPSS, you should be getting the same as well. So 0 0.03 would mean it is less than 0 0.05. So the hypothesis which says that the type of drug has a statistically significant impact on fatigue can be accepted. But now I am going to run a few others as well. Uh, normality test, homogeneity test. Normality seems to be fine, but our uh, homogeneity that is, you know, slightly uh, violated. So that is a bit of an issue actually, but then uh, that's okay. 
usually these tests are pretty robust with uh, little, little violations, so that's not going to be a bigger problem. Now, once this is done, now there's a bit of an issue here once again. The issue is ANOVA will tell that the performance of the three drugs are different from one another or the three groups are different from one another. Although descriptively I can see that Actifast is better than Panadol, I need to know. Now, there are three groups here. Is it the Panadol that is statistically uh, is it the panadol that is different in a statistically significant manner from Actifast? Or is it, you know, the panadol and the control group? Or is it the Actifast and the control group? Because there are different combinations here. If I get pairwise comparisons, I need to know, is it the Actifast and the panadol that is significantly different? Is it the Actifast and the control group that is significantly different? Or is it the panadol and the control group that is significantly different? For that, you have to do a test called a post hoc test. Now here, there are different post hoc tests. In SPSS, you have a wide variety of post hoc tests. But here you have only two, and one of the most commonly used one is two keys HSD. So if you click on two keys HSD, it will run a bunch of T tests for you. Now see here, one is Panadol. Panadol and two is control group, three is Actifast. So Panadol and control group, it has a mean difference of three points, but it is not significant. Earlier it was significant because I had six participants per group. Now I have removed one, so I have five participants. So this one in this stage is not significant. Panadol and the control group. Now I'm going to check whether Panadol and Actifast is significant or not. Panadol and Actifast, so Actifast is better. They have a mean difference of 1.40 points, but that difference is not significant. Now I'm going to check whether my control group and the Actifast is significant or not. If you notice here, my control group and Actifast, that has a difference of 4.40, and that is significant because the p-value is 0 0.01. Now you see here, I have three groups. ANOVA will tell whether drug has an effect on fatigue, but it will not tell you which drug is better than which. And if you notice here, Actifast is better than Panadol, but the difference between Actifast and Panadol is not statistically significant. The statistical significance is actually available in Actifast and the control group. So compared to a guy who has not received anything, people who get Actifast, yes, that difference is statistically significant. But compared to a guy who is getting Panadol, Panadol Actifast tends to be better. People claim it to be better. The results will also tell it to be better. But in this study that we have done, that difference between Panadol and Actifast is not statistically significant. But if you get the ANOVA as an overall thing, that is still significant. So the type of drug has an impact on uh, what you call the fatigue. It's just that although we think one drug is one drug tends to perform better than the rest, that is not the case, at least based on this data. So this is why an ANOVA is very important. When people say, look, uh, our drug is better than the rest, these are, this is exactly how it works and all of that, we can actually run into a bit of uh, in-depth information and then we can find which one is actually performing better than the other. So if you don't do a post hoc test and stop all the stuff from here, you might say, I ran an ANOVA, very significant, Actifast and all of this is very good. But when you run the post hoc test, suddenly you come to the realization, okay, my drugs have an impact on fatigue, but one drug seems to be working against the control group, but compared to the other drug that we have, it is not that significant. It might be significant if you have a larger sample, but with the limited sample we have here, this is exactly what it says. Now, based on this, we can go ahead and report our findings. So this is our report. Here I have said, as per the results obtained in this study, 
drugs have a statistically significant effect in reducing fatigue and I have given the F statistic and then the degrees of freedom. In T-test, you have only one degree of freedom called DF in your output. In an ANOVA, you would notice two degrees of freedom called DF1 and DF2. DF1 here is 2, DF2 is 12. When we do manual calculations, I will further explain how exactly we get this DF1 and DF2. But right now, we don't need to worry too much about it. And here I have given the F value 5.22 and our P value. So on average, individuals who took Actifast reported the least amount of fatigue. Okay, the least amount of fatigue, which is mean 1.6 standard deviation 0 0.8 compared to Panadol group M and uh, control group. Thus, H1 is accepted. And you can say based on the, now we have done a postdoc uh, test as well. You can say based on uh, two keys, HSD, Actifast is significantly different in uh, alleviating fatigue compared to the control group but not so with the Panadol group. Now we know, look, study is effective, study is acceptable, hypothesis is accepted. It's just that both the drugs are okay, but in this, the Panadol is not effective against the control group. It's the Actifast that is uh, effective against the control group, but if you get the Panadol and Panadol Actifast, those two guys are also not very different from one another. So this is how you would do an interpretation from a scientific study. Now you probably might realize compared to the correlations we ran in the previous semester, here this will enable us to do large scale studies, proper experiments. Quality experiments usually have to be it has to be simple in the sense you don't need to overcomplicate it. And if you notice here, we have three clearly identified groups. We have a dependent variable. And of course, with the nature of the study, we can add more variables and all of that as well. But this pretty much get the job done. Okay. So this is how you would run a one-way ANOVA. Now, one independent variable, three groups, one way ANOVA. One independent variable, you have two groups, that is a between group T test. Now, the question you should be asking is, what if I have more than one independent variable? Now, see here, I am proposing gender has an impact on quality of life. But what if gender and satisfaction both have an impact on quality of life? So whenever you have a second independent variable, then it automatically becomes a two-way ANOVA. If you have a two-way ANOVA, you may have two groups in one variable and three groups in another variable. Maybe four groups in one variable and three groups in another variable. So it changes. So what we usually do is, Whenever you have more than one independent variable in a study, we usually do something like this. For example, see here under gender, we have how many groups? Three. So I'm going to write three here. And then I'm going to tell three times my next variable is satisfaction. Satisfaction also has three variables and I'm going to write three again. We call the study, the gender and satisfaction's impact on quality of life, a three by three design. A three by three design means the amount of numbers here will indicate how many independent variables you have. So I have three numbers, three by three, sorry, two numbers, three by three. Two numbers means two independent variables. The first number is three. What it means is the first independent variable has three groups and the second independent has three groups as well. So a three by three design is an example of three by three design would be gender and satisfaction on the quality of life.
So whenever you have more than one independent variable, we actually call it a factorial arrangement. So this one is a three by three factorial design, or one could say a factorial, you know, arrangement. A factorial arrangement means you have more than one factor or more than one independent variable. So gender here is an independent variable. You can also call it a factor as well. That's another word that you can use. Satisfaction is another factor. So one way ANOVA means one independent variable. Two way ANOVA means two independent variables. If you have three independents, then it becomes a three way ANOVA. So it all depends upon how many variables you need to use. But the general rule of thumb is keep it to a minimum. Maybe two independent variables is more than enough. But in one-way ANOVAs and two-way ANOVAs, one thing you have to remember is we will always have only one dependent variable. Dependent variable is going to be only one all the time. So if you have only one dependent variable now here our dv is quality of life if you have only one dependent variable at any given time we call such studies univariate studies which means one dependent variable you have more than one dependent variable like two or two plus then we call such studies multivariate studies now we'll be learning in depth about multivariate studies in your fourth semester in this semester, we'll be focusing mostly on univariate studies. If I have only one dependent variable, but multiple independents, how am I going to do? Now, I can show you why exactly we tell students to focus only on one to two independent variables at a time. Now, this is an example of a factorial design. Now, let me dissect this for you, okay? Here I have a three by three by three design. What it means is I have three independent variables. Each independent variable has three groups in it. Now, what are my three independent variables? My first independent variable is gender. I have three groups in this men, women, and those who don't like to identify. So I have my three groups and I am going to measure the quality of life. Now here in this case, I am going to measure uh, SWL that is satisfaction with life. So I am going to measure satisfaction of life for men, women and those who do not identify. So if you ask about a one way ANOVA, this entire thing now I am going to highlight, uh, sorry, color in uh, green color, that's not visible. This is the one way I know if you compare all of this. If you have gender, but you are going to compare only men and women, this would be a T test. See, you compare only two groups, men and women, and then you have their satisfaction mean, women satisfaction mean. So gender has an impact on satisfaction. This would be your study. Okay. If you want to do a one way ANOVA, suddenly this is your one way ANOVA. So you have gender, men, women, and those who do not identify. So you have three groups, same independent variable, and you are going to compare three means. However, if you are going to add a little bit of more spice to this by adding another variable, another independent variable, suddenly you have more than three groups to compare. I'll explain you why. Now let's say I am going to do a study where gender and locus of control has something to do with satisfaction with life. Now I have my locus of control here. I'm going to color this guy. And I have three groups. Those who are high on locus of control, those who are moderate on locus of control, and those who are low on locus of control. Now, that would be a three by three design. Three by three means two independents. Each one has three levels. So. If you multiply three by three, that means nine groups, nine comparisons. What are my nine comparisons? These are my nine comparisons. I'm going to just color it again in red color. I have men who are high on locus of control. I have men who are moderate on locus of control. 
I have men who are lone locus of control. The same is happening for women. The same is happening for those who do not identify as well. So when you do an ANOVA, ANOVA will test all of this. But you have to do a post-op test to see which group is different from which group. So men would be different from women in the high locus of control group. Maybe in uh, the moderate locus of control group, women and people who do not uh, identify might have differences. So now you will see suddenly the comparison becomes tougher when you add one more independent variable with three levels. Now let's say you want to spice this further. Some person comes and say, hey, hey you know what? We need to add another variable as well, an independent, that is perceived self-worth. Now suddenly you are going to tell, okay, look, gender, locus of control, and perceived self-worth, all three of these things will have an impact on satisfaction with life. Now we have people who have high perceived self-worth with high, moderate, and low locus of control and their satisfaction with life. And then we have people who have moderate, you know, perceived self-worth with the same, you know, locus of control combination and the gender combinations as well. And again, people who have low self-worth with the same combinations of locus of control and gender. So suddenly this entire thing is your group comparison. Now this has become a 3 by 3 by 3 design. 3 by 3 by 3 means 3 into 3 is 9. 9 into 3 that is 27. You have to compare 27 groups to figure out how exactly the groups will change from one another. When you run a 3-way ANOVA, your initial output will tell, okay, look, this is significant. But you had to do a post hoc test to figure out which groups are different from which? So if you have a 3 by 3 by 3 kind of a design, a factorial arrangement, suddenly you have quite a lot to test. 27 groups, that 27 group means you need to have a massive sample. Because if you don't have people for some of these components, some of these groups, your analysis will not be successful. So we need to have a larger sample. And with the larger sample, the stakes are high, which means the study has to be well controlled. You have to focus a lot on your extraneous variables. And at the same time, your sample has to be more random. And the larger sample has to be representative to the population. And it has to be generalized to the public as well. So you have quite a lot to think in this kind of a situation. Now, Generally, what we tell the students is to keep things to a minimum, go for a one-way ANOVA, go for a two-way ANOVA, and don't try to go for you know, anything beyond that with ANOVAs. Why? Because not because you can't run it, you will definitely run it. It's just that the interpretation is going to be pretty difficult. Why? Because you have multiple groups to compare. Okay. Now, here's the two-way ANOVA, another example. Uh, we have done the same example in our correlational analysis as well, identifying the impact of organizational commitment, job autonomy on turnover intentions. See, this is a three by three design. Three by three means I have two independents. The first has three groups. The second has three groups. So it becomes a three by three design, which means altogether I have nine groups to compare here as well for their Turnover intentions, which means their intention to leave an organization. Now, I need to come up with my hypothesis here. When you run a t-test or an ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA, you just need to write only one hypothesis saying, drug has something to do with fatigue. Drug has a statistically significant relationship with fatigue. So that's it. But when you have one more independent variable, you have to run at least three hypotheses. The first hypothesis will tell you this. Now, based on this example, we are hypothesizing organization commitment has an impact on 
turnover intentions who has a relationship on, uh, with turnover intentions and i have my second hypothesis second hypothesis is going to tell <clears throat> job autonomy also has a statistically significant relationship with turnover intentions and my third hypothesis will tell that organizational commitment and job autonomy has together has an impact on turnover intentions. So we actually call this an interaction when two independent variables impact the dependent variable at the same time, we call it an interaction. Now, here's what you need to understand. You have to think of this theoretically. Let's say there are a bunch of people who are depressed right now in your clinic. Let's say a journalist come and ask, okay, you are the clinical psychologist here. Tell us why your patients are depressed here. Then you are going to tell, well, the present economy has something to do with this. Economic turbulence has an effect on the mood of people. That's why these guys are depressed. <clears throat> so let's do that. Let me draw it here. Now this is... This is exactly how we are going to, you know, apply this in our day-to-day -day life. So I'm going to just quickly create a study here. Now I have, I always tell, you know, whenever you want to do a study, you need to have a problem. Now we are going to create a problem here. Okay. Here we have mood. I have a bunch of people in my clinic who have low mood. So I'm going to just say mood is my dependent variable. I'm going to understand why the people in my clinic has low mood. Now, let's say if me or you, if we are the clinical psychologist, someone might come and ask, okay, can you explain why there is low mood? So I'm going to tell it's the economic turbulence. Or let's say uh, easier one, you know, it's the financial threats people have because there's economic problems. Economic problems make people perceive financial threats. Financial threats is the reason why people have low mood. So then one could ask, is it always the financial threats? I know my uncle who has financial problems, but he's still living okay. He's very happy. So maybe it's the people with financial threats, but who are very low on self-esteem as well. Now I am going to say, okay, what you say makes sense. Maybe it's the people who actually have financial threats and also self-esteem issues. So I'm going to now change my study a little bit here. I'm going to tell, okay, look, you know what? Financial threats and self-esteem both have something to do with mood. Now, you are required to design a study here. Now we are going to design this study we are going to tell <clears throat> financial threat has something to do with mood. And this is my first hypothesis. So I'm going to just write H1 here. This is my first hypothesis, okay? I am hypothesizing that financial threats will have something to do with the mood of people. And again, I'm going to develop another hypothesis that is Self-esteem has something to do with mood of a person as well, which is pretty understandable. So I'm going to, you know, take that here as well. Where is that? So I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to write H2. Now, one could ask this question. Okay, now you have said financial threat has something to do with mood. Self-esteem has something to do with mood. But don't you think if you put all of these together, people who have financial threats at the same time and people who are low on self-esteem, when you put this combination together, don't you think that people are going to have more impact on their mood? Then you are going to tell, yeah, well, that makes sense. I think if both of these are together, then that could have serious effects as well. So then I am going to hypothesize that as well. So that is going to be my hypothesis. Three, I'm going to write it here. Financial threat and self-esteem. 
both of these could have an impact on mood as well. Like this. This is my third hypothesis. Because this is also true, right? Because people could actually have something like this. Now, if you notice here, based on the problem, now we have just created a study. Now, I need some more information about this. Now, I have my three hypotheses, but I need more information. How am I going to measure mood? That's the first question that I should be asking from myself. Let's say I am going to measure mood from a mood scale. I don't know whether there's a scale called the mood scale, but I'm going to pretend now that there's a scale called a mood scale. So I'm going to measure this mood scale. And anyways, we need only the numeric scores of people. So it's a continuous variable. Why? It's a dependent variable. Now financial threat. This is one of my independent variables. And you know, in to run the ANOVA, you need to have an independent variable an independent variable should have at least two groups. So I am going to administer, let's say there's a scale called a financial threat scale. Let's say, okay, let me, I'm going to write here. There's a scale called financial threat scale. I'm going to administer this. And after administering this, I am going to categorize people into two groups. My first group says, people who have high financial threat and my second group is people who have low financial threat. How am I dividing these people? I am dividing them not randomly. I am dividing them based on a scale. I give them a scale. They answer the scale. Based on their answers, I am categorizing them as high financial threat or low financial threat. Now, to make more sense of the study, I am going to come up with the sample size. Let's say our study, 60 participants. I am going to administer financial threat scale for all these 60 participants. And I am going to divide them into high financial threat and low financial threat. Now, I need to measure self-esteem as well. Self-esteem can be measured using... But we have a scale for that as well. Rosenberg self-esteem scale. Rosenberg self-esteem scale. I'm going to measure people using that as well. Once again here, based on the score people obtained, I am going to divide them into two groups. Uh, people who have high self-esteem and people who have low self-esteem like this. Now, this is a factorial arrangement as well, but this is a two by two factorial arrangement. Why it is a two by two factorial arrangement? It's a two by two factorial arrangement because I have two independents and each independent has only two groups or two levels in it, two by two. So all together, I am going to check four individual, uh, four individual, uh, four separate groups. The same 60 participants will be given the financial threat and you will be dividing them into high or low financial threat. A person who appears under high financial threat does not appear in the low financial threat group. You use the same participants and then you give them the self-esteem scale as well. Some will have high self-esteem, some will have low self-esteem. So there will be people who have high self-esteem so high financial threat, high self-esteem, high financial threat, low self-esteem, low financial threat, high self-esteem, and low financial threat, low self-esteem. And similarly, you are going to check all these combinations for their mood scores. Now you can actually draw it some uh, like this as, so let me show you. I'm going to just copy these guys. This is our example. I'm going to paste it here. Now, what is my first variable? My first variable is financial threat. I don't need this. Why? Because I have only two levels. I'm going to just delete these guys. So I have high financial threat, 
I have low financial threat. What is my second independent variable? That is self-esteem. I have uh, high self-esteem and then I have low self-esteem. So I'm going to remove this one as well. This is also, we don't need this. And I'm going to check mood. The mean of their mood. So I'm going to just write mood. Mood is my dependent variable. I'm going to see whether the mood score actually varies between these four groups. That is exactly what I want to find. So this is my study actually. If you if you think about this, what we just discussed can be, you can draw it like this. Financial threat is one of the independence. Self-esteem is one of the independence. So technically speaking, this is our study. If I draw my hypothesis like this, it's a two by two factorial design. Why do I tell it a two by two? I have individuals who have high financial threat, high self-esteem, so I'm going to check their mood. I'm going to check the mood of high financial threat, low self-esteem as well, and low financial threat, high self-esteem, low financial threat, and uh, low self-esteem. So altogether, you have two, sorry, four separate groups that you need to compare. You can test all of these hypotheses by running a two-way ANOVA. Why is uh, why why a two-way ANOVA is going to fit this? You know. If it is a two-group comparison within one independent, that's a t-test. If it is more than two groups for the same independent, that's a one-way ANOVA. Now, here I have two groups for one independent, but I have two independents. In that kind of a situation, I need to run a two-way ANOVA. I need to keep this simple as well. So without going for three groups for each independent, if you have three groups for each independent, it's going to be a three by three design, which means you have nine groups to compare. Nine groups is tough. So I'm going to divide people into two groups, two, at, uh, two per each independent. So two by two would give me only four groups to compare. Now, this is a basic impression of a two by two design where you would have to use a two way and over. Now, you might wonder, if we run something like this, how exactly a typical output would look like? So if you run this on SPSS, a typical output would look like this. Now, coming back to this example, organizational commitment, job autonomy and turnover intentions, I hope after doing this exercise, financial threat, self-esteem and mood, now you can understand what exactly is happening in this one as well. Commitment, autonomy, and turnover intentions. So we are saying commitment has something to do with turnover intentions. Autonomy has something to do with turnover intentions. But these guys together would have something to do with turnover as well. And when you run the two-way ANOVA, now next week we'll run the two-way ANOVA in the class. But when you run it, it will look like this. Now let's try to interpret this. This is a SPSS output. This is a two-way ANOVA. Test between subjects effects. Now, I have three variables. My variables are named in SPSS like this. Autonomy, LMH, that is one of the variables that uh, has taken data about autonomy of people. Then organizational commitment has been labeled as OGCOM LMH. And this is the place where we test our third hypothesis, that combined one. Now, Let's check the first one. Autonomy, if you take it here, it has a value of 10.320. And if you check the significance, this is the significance. This is significant. So one could, if you go through this table here, organizational commitment, if you go through the same line, the p-value is less than 0 0.05. What it means is organizational commitment has a statistically significant effect on turnover intentions. Now you go to, uh, sorry, autonomy. You go to uh, analyze organizational commitment as well, the same thing that is also significant. So both the organize, uh, both autonomy has something to do with uh, turnover intentions and commitment has something to do with turnover intentions. 
Then you go and check this one. See, autonomy, and they have put this little mark here, star mark, to say that we are going to check whether these two together, we are going to check whether there's going to be an interaction, whether these things, whether these two variables are going to interact with one another. That also, if you check the p-value, that is less than 0 0.05, because it is 0 0.01. So 0 0.01 is statistically significant. So what it means is organizational and job autonomy, commitment and autonomy has a statistically significant interaction in determining turnover intentions. So I am accepting my third hypothesis. If this third hypothesis is accepted, generally speaking, I don't need to worry about this first two because my intention is to actually show that these two together would have something to do. The reason why we have combined it is not to check whether one of these have an effect on the other. The reason why we have combined this is to show that, okay, look, these two things can determine my dependent variable. So in the instance where the interaction is not significant. Then you can go ahead and check whether my independent variable separately would have something to do with the dependent variable. Now here we have an interaction effect. We call it an interaction effect. If two independents interact and if it is significant, we call it an interaction effect. If we don't have an interaction, then we go for the independent variables to see whether those independents are significant or not. If they are significant, but the interaction effect is not there, then we call such significant independent variables and you know de uh, dependent variable relations, we call them main effects. Now, we'll discuss in depth about uh, interaction effects and main effects in the next week. If not, it will be a little bit too much if we try to dive into all of this at the same time. But the basic idea that I wanted to give you is that you can run a two-way ANOVA to see whether the two independents will actually interact or not. A lot of students do this mistake where they uh, combine two variables, two independents, just to see whether one has the first one has something to do with the DV and the second one has something to do with the DV. No, for that you can do two separate studies. The reason why we combine both of these in the same location is to see whether these two would have something to do with uh, the dependent variable. Now, let me make a further change here. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, give me a second. This particular thing, you know, that you see here, the one that I have, you know, uh, I have used a little rectangle to cover it all up. This is what we call a conceptual framework. Let me write it here. Conceptual framework. I want to do a study and then I conceptualize it first, which means, you know, I I, I tell others, you know, I think I have a study, but uh, this is exactly how my study is going to work. And then I first draw it and tell it to them. This is my study. I have two variables, two independents, and those two independents would have an impact on the dependent variable. So we call it a conceptual framework. So whenever we think about research, we first visualize it like this. If you can learn right now to visualize this kind of research, it will greatly improve your understanding of how to use the statistical test. Now, there are some students who think of a statistical test and then they try their best to design a study to fit the statistical test. We can't do that. You have to first think of a problem. Based on the problem, you design the study. See, I started the study by thinking that I have a group of depressed people. Then I decided what may have caused them to be depressed. And then I am proposing, okay, this and this could have an impact on the mood of people, making them depressed. 
and that is exactly how I have designed my study. And then I think, okay, if I need to go ahead and measure this, what would be an exact test for me to go ahead and measure this? And that would be here in this example, a two-way ANOVA. So one could ask, how sure are you about you know, using a two-way ANOVA? Then I tell them, look, this is a two by two factorial design. I have 60 participants. If I do a two by two factorial design, this is exactly how the arrangement would look like. See, four groups all together. So then I would have definitely run a two-way ANOVA. Now, this is the process that we would have to always follow. Now, I, am, I have video recorded this lecture. I am going to upload this to my uh, channel as well. So in case if you want to revisit this later, you can actually revisit this video just to be on the safe side that you have a better comprehension on how we design our studies. And I'm going to recommend this to our seniors as well. Uh, because this understanding on how to design a study is extremely important. Uh, some have the impression, you know, you need to have a big dash study, you know, so that you can uh, uh, run complicated statistics. So the the rigorous, uh, the, the complexity of statistics has nothing to do with the quality of your study. And the complexity of your uh, problem has nothing to do with the quality of your study as well. I think the quality of your research is in its simplicity. A bigger problem can be still addressed through a simple research. So it is your job to make it simple. So for example, instead of three by three, if you can go for a two by two, that itself is a way of simplifying your study. So if you want to go for a ANOVA, one way ANOVA, that is also one way of doing a very clean study. A T test, that's a very cleaner way of doing a study. This is just, you know, uh, for additional information, how to design a two way ANOVA. Now, in this module, we'll be running two way ANOVAs, but the larger chunk of time we'll be spending to understand uh, one way ANOVAs and T test. So, in our module, uh, this particular lesson tends to be the hardest lesson and then after that you know the rest of the lessons tend to be a uh, quite a lot smoother compared to this so if some of you uh, couldn't uh, understand some of the concepts that we have discussed here don't worry about it because in the upcoming weeks we'll be again rediscussing some of these aspects and i need to make sure that all of you understand how to run a and no anity test and all of that by the end of this semester. So we have enough time to do that. But uh, if you understand all of this uh, in one go, very good. Uh, because, you know, you can pretty much do most of the analysis from here after. So it's just a matter of learning the rest later. The, the key skill that you have to learn is not to think this concept in terms of, uh, you know, the, the statistical theory and all of that. You just visualize it and see you know how many groups i have and then what's the test that fits here so if you can train your mind to match the study design with the study statistical test it will become very easy so this is exactly why we spend some some time discussing how to draw this if you learn how to draw a design it will largely improve your chances of figuring out the test now from this point onwards whenever someone tells uh, I need to do a study. Can you help? The first thing that you need to do is take your pen or pencil, take a blank paper, start to, you know, draw it like this. And then drawing it greatly helps. And then you can also develop a small table like this to figure out the groups. So then life becomes quite easy. Okay. Now with that, any questions about what we have discussed? Okay. So if there's no question, if you guys have any questions later, you know, you can uh, always send me a message. And uh, if there's no other questions, I think then we can call it a day. I will uh, give me a couple or so hours. I will uh, uh, upload this and then uh, send the link to CourseWeb. So students who have missed also can uh, uh, re-watch the, they can watch the video as well. And any other student who would want to go through it, they can, uh, you know, uh, rewatch it as well. So uh, if there's no questions, then I guess that's it from my end. So then uh, thank you very much for joining uh, for today's class for this online session. And uh, I shall see you guys again in the next week.